Hi, so a little while ago I made a video um, saying don't ruin your favourite music. <laughs> um, and I've been thinking about this, it maybe seems a little bit mean to to say to people who don't play fluently, stop ruining your favourite music. Um, <laughs> and in a way I don't mean it. If I, if I use language as the analogy for fluency, um, maybe you'll start to sort of really understand where I'm coming from. So f I'll give you this example. I once learned a song, Tchaikovsky song, when I was studying classical singing a long, long time ago. Um, and I learned this song uh, in Russian. Well, I learned it in English first, and then a friend of mine who who was at music college with me, who who could could speak Russian, had a Russian degree, he said to me, you really need to, to actually understand what you're, you're doing. If you were singing a song in French, I have some French, he said you, you would understand the words. So he set about um, trying to to teach me this song. It took an absolute age. He, he wrote out the phonetics of, uh, of the Russian, first of all, and taught me how to to actually say the words and then sing the words. And then he, he wrote a translation of the words in English, a uh, translation of the poem uh, in English. And, and then he actually wrote, did an amazing thing. He, he on Over the top of each of the Russian words in the poem, he wrote a literal translation of the English word. And that gave me an insight. But it still, of course, didn't mean that I was fluent in Russian. What it, what it did mean that when I first learnt the song and I sang it, just phonetically, what it revealed was that I hadn't a clue what I was singing about. When they had these the translations, literal translations of the, the, the Russian words over the top of, of, of written over the top in English, it sort of, I don't know, it, it brought the poem to life in a way that, that, that was completely lost on me before. So I guess I sang it with more meaning. So when people play or sing pieces of music not fluently, when they don't understand the, the vocabulary, they don't understand the words, if you like, uh, the musical equivalent of words, things I call rhythm cells and tonal blocks, which are plugged into the deep structure of rhythm, the, the rhythmic matrix and, and the tonal map, which is whatever your instrument happens to be, but it's the same tonal map, obviously, that we all use on every instrument. So, so when we don't know what the, the the rhythm cells are and we don't know what the tonal black blocks are and we don't know where they plug into the underlying structure of, of, of tonality and rhythm, then in a way what we do is we perform the gist of the music. So imagine, a bit of a hard thought experiment this, but, but give it a go. Imagine if you'd never been taught words. You'd never been, never actually been given that basic education as a child as to, to what the words are, you'd probably still understand the gist of what people are saying. Um, but you might obviously struggle with things like reading and writing and maybe even conversation to some, some degree. You'd struggle a lot with your confidence. Some people would be better than others. And I think this is the sort of situation that we have with music. We, we, we have an intuitive grasp. We get the gist of the music, but we don't really understand it kind of literally. So let me give you another funny little example inside of that weird thought experiment of never having learned words. I'm going to say a sentence to you now. There were four people in the boat when the storm arrived. Now, did you understand that? I'll say it again now, properly understanding the words. There were four people in the boat when the storm arrived. Now, phonetically, I said it right. There were four people in the boat when the storm arrived. Mechanically, it was right. And now you've heard the sentence. Now you've heard there were four people in the boat when the storm arrived. Even if I say it in a really funny way, like, for example, I could even say it really over dramatically, but still not really grasping where the words divide up. I could go, there were f or p pulling the boat when the storm arrived. You might still actually hear the sentence as it is. And I think this is what I meant when I was talking in that video about ruining your favourite music. When we, when we sort of give a karaoke performance or a sort of muscle memory performance of a piece that we know, we think we're playing it better than we really are because we remember a more coherent performance that made sense. 
we translate it. I think we do this when we watch these awful programmes like X Factor and and so on, where we hear people singing songs that we know, karaoke sort of shows they are in a way, aren't they? So they're singing songs that we know and we think it's okay because we know the song. But if we heard them singing something we didn't know, we'd probably discover that in many cases their their phrasing, their their musicianship, their ability to phrase and, and make sense of it rhythmically and tonally is a bit limited. It wouldn't sound in tune, it wouldn't sound in rhythm to us if we didn't already know the song. So this is very interesting, isn't it, that music, to make sense, how do we make it make sense? Well, we it's like language, it has vocabulary. So any piece of music that I play makes sense. If I play something you've never heard before, which is what I do, I improvise, hopefully it makes sense to you. So that made sense to you. It, it fulfilled certain, a certain sort of unfolding a story. It, it said something to you because you understood the vocabulary, um, maybe not literally, but intuitively you, you got the gist because the vocabulary that I was saying was musical. If I play it, if I play music in a way that sounds like this, listen to this. That's a bit like there were four people in verb O Twentus Torma Ride. It's kind of all over the place. I'm doing an impression of what I hear when I hear people playing playing music that I know in a way that doesn't make sense, that it sort of sounds ruined. It doesn't it doesn't make sense to me anymore. If you'd heard that little piece that I just made up then, if you'd heard it before and you knew it, you might have thought it made sense, just like there were four people in the boat when the storm arrived. So understanding a language, obviously it's a bigger ask to learn a language than to just learn one poem. But I'm telling you, it took me ages. It took me a lot of hours to be able to, to sing that song with any kind of grasp of, of, of the language. Um, that Russian Tchaikovsky song it took a long, long time. When you've become fluent in a language, obviously it, it then becomes a piece of cake. It becomes really, really easy to, um, to, to do all sorts of things with it, to, to read, to write, to, you know, it, it's, it's a massive thing being fluent. It gives you so much skill. It's about empowerment. So, so what I'm about as a teacher and as a musician is about, you know, giving people music that makes sense, which is all about empowerment. You know, if you can, if you can make music and really understand what you're doing, um, obviously that, that's your personal empowerment as a musician, but as well as that, it means that the music you're making makes more sense. Let's take another example. I think this is the one that I used in that, that video, Stop Ruining Your Favourite Music, another piece that's often played, The Entertainer by Scott Joplin. So we often hear it played like this. So that to me is like there were four people in verb O Twentus Torma arrived. It doesn't really make sense, but obviously we all know the tune, so so we grasp it. The underlying rhythm, the underlying sort of rhythmic matrix of that is common time, is inward rhythm, flowing rhythm. Da 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 dee da 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 And into that groove that underlying groove, that underlying matrix, as I like to call it, that I'm feeling and knowing, I'm plugging in rhythm cells. There are actually only 12 rhythm cells. <laughs> There's only 12 rhythm cells to learn and I'm plugging them all into, into the matrix there and it makes more sense, it sounds better. People often say at this point, no, you're just playing it more musically. Um, 
No, um, maybe, but the point is how I'm playing it musically is that I'm understanding it in terms of a structure, a rhythmic structure, a groove and rhythm cells. I'm also understanding it in terms of a, a tonal structure and tonal blocks that I plug into that. So it makes more sense as I'm telling you the story. <laughs> more sense. Um, now, of course, some people might say, I prefer the other one. And if they do, then that's fine. Obviously, they should play that one. And this is interesting because I think, you know, in in language, in, in say, I don't know, say Shakespeare or something like that, there is, to some degree, the same thing going on where we actually don't want it to make too much sense. We want it to sound obscure, you know. I mean, think of a lot of very modern poetry that's very difficult to understand. Maybe we, we like performances to sound unintelligible a little bit with language but I think with music it's it's another it's another level you know sometimes where we want the music to sound difficult and, and obscure obviously this becomes really true in sort of modern jazz and modern classical where you know a very sort of male dominated intellectual competitive kind of world that uh, those genres um, occupy uh, the values shift and it becomes about other things than simply making sense than simply telling a beautiful story or you know moving people and, and, and making them making them have some solace or catharsis or something you know something that the music something that the music is you know that they can re that the audience can relate to becomes less important than you know showcasing something which is incredibly difficult or, or clever uh, so that that's allowed. That's that's a whole sort of aesthetic area, I guess, that I'm not particularly interested in. But a lot of people are. I'm interested in making music make sense. The other thing I think I might have mentioned on that video, I'm not sure if I did or not, without checking, um, is how when people learn a piece, perhaps for an exam or something like that, a beautiful classical piece, they can get really sort of like fed up with the piece and they start thinking it's a horrible piece. It's often not the piece that's the problem. It's actually the way you're playing it, you know, like a famous piece like Fear Elise, you often hear it like... You know, obviously that's making it sound dreadful, isn't it? It's not the piece that's the problem, it needs to have sense. So it's have that groove. I'll do another video talking a bit more in detail about groove and rhythm and, and kind of how how I really believe that this is one of the most important things. Obviously tonality is just as important as well but often the big difference is the rhythm. If rhythm sounds lumpy and you know you don't feel it in your body then you, your fingers feel out of control, it, it, everything starts to feel awkward and difficult. And we can start to really hate our piano playing. We can start to hate the music that we're playing. And then, you know, we make that excuse of saying, oh, I want to play my favourite pop song, as if that would really make any difference. Maybe if you keep translating it back to the performance that you love listening to, you can feel that sense that you're doing something that you like. But in actual fact, you might be just ruining your favourite song. What I teach is to become actually fluent in the language of music so that you can play whatever music you like and you can improvise, and you can you know, play by ear, you can sight read, you can look at the score and hear it in your head. These are the kind of skills that fluency gives you. Fluency in music is not some kind of weird, you know, trick, it's not some inbuilt uh, talent. It's simply understanding, it's simply learning the language. And it's, it's a childlike learning. To do it as an adult is a little bit of a challenge because you've got to get into the, the mindset of a child, but you've just got to learn your language. You've just got to learn all the rhythm cells, all 12 of them, and you've got to learn especially 12 major and 12 minor harmonic blocks. And then you plug them into the underlying structure of tonality and rhythm, the groove and, and the kind of tonal, the tonal matrix. Once you can do that, once you have that grasp, obviously the power it gives you is just amazing. And the point that I'm trying to make in this video is that your, your ability to communicate musically improves tremendously. You, you, you start to be able to make music make sense. <laughs>